So I recorded a video on pressure drop in and flow analysis for parallel branches. And two people quickly pointed out that I was only considering branches that originate at the same point and then converge to the same point. And there's a specific reason I did that. The person who asked me to explain the parallel branches was actually talking about cooling water systems where you have a distribution network in the form of a cooling water supply. And then you gather up all of those cooling water return lines into one common header and then you send it back to your cooling tower. So in my head, it was diverging and then converging again. But rightly so, they point out that it is the analysis is uh, slightly different if those different parallel branches never converge again. And so I'm going to take the three uh, same branches that I analyzed, but instead of looking at the case where they converge again, what I'm going to do instead is I'm going to make up different uh, terminating conditions for each of those branches and then see how to develop the system curve for the three parallel branches. So these are the three parallel branches that we looked at last time. Uh, you can see they originate at the same point and then they converge again to a common point. Now what we're going to do is we're going to split them up. We're going to keep the lengths and the valves that we have in there identical. But what we're going to do instead is we're going to terminate them differently. The first one, which we call branch A, we're going to let that terminate to atmosphere. You can see I'm collecting the stuff in a bucket. Branch B, we're going to put it into the base of a tank that has six meters worth of uh, six meters head in it. So there's a level of six meters of the fluid. We're just pumping water at, at ambient temperatures. And then finally, branch C, I am going to put it into a header that connects to all sorts of other suppliers and consumers. We don't know anything about it. All that we know is that that pressure, uh, that header pressure is maintained at two bar. Now, even though I spent a little bit of time thinking of different scenarios of where these streams could go, Ultimately, all we are interested in is these numbers in white. What is that fixed pressure that I'm pumping against? And it is a constant pressure. You, you need to, in any sort of simulation software, even if you were trying to use software to simulate this, you need to terminate and eventually say, look, this is where I end the simulation. And at this point, you need to define either a pressure or you need to define a flow rate. Otherwise, your problem is not fully defined. And if you're saying, well, Pat, downstream, I don't have a fixed constant pressure. I actually have an exchanger. I have a reactor. I have all sorts of things happening there. Then I'd say to you, then that branch is not fully defined until the point where you can get to a constant pressure uh, or you can define the exact flow rate in that branch. Uh, you, you need to further define the system curve for that individual branch by itself. Now, look, you're not going to be able to follow just by watching this video by itself. You should go and see what it is that I did in my previous video. So we're just going to assume that you've got a handle of how I generated the converging parallel branches. So here we have the exact same system curves that we had in my previous video except the only thing that's different is that static back pressure up against which we are pumping. In the case of branch A, we said we were going out to atmosphere, so this line hasn't moved. Branch B was up against that six meter tank, so you can see 0.6 bar uh, is the static load, meaning before, if I don't have at least 0.6 bar, I've got zero flow. And then similarly, branch C, this yellow line, is uh, into that two bar header. So all that we do by defining that back pressure is we're shifting the system curve up and down. So remember, the first thing I told you in my last video was flip the axes. The way, the reason you want to flip the axes is because you want to select a driving pressure and you want to see the resultant flow of what that driving pressure creates in my individual branches. So here I've got branches A, B, and C flipped, and it just confirms what we were saying earlier. The blue branch, you get flow from the get-go because of, it goes through the zero point because we're just going through into atmospheric pressure. And here are the threshold pressures, the minimum pressures that you need to go, go into the other branches. Obviously, below a pressure of two bar, I'm not going into branch C. So I flip those. The reason I flip those is so that I can calculate Y values from an equation. And here we go. We've now got 
uh, polynomial fit to these branches. In the previous example, I used a different equation form because it fit quite nicely because everything passed through the origin. Here they don't, so I used an eighth order polynomial, and you can see it's quite a, it's a good fit. Uh, the highlighter type lines are the fits, and um, but they're quite complicated equations. And so I get the coefficient of each term like this using this formula, uh, line estimation array formula. Go look it up yourself if you ever if you if you ever do something like this. Uh, but I found that quite useful. I've only just figured that out. So the point of getting all of these coefficients, ignore the all branches, you only need it for each individual branch, is so that you can add up the y values easily for a given driving uh, driving force, a given pressure drop across that branch. And that's what I've done. I've taken those coefficients. I've selected a whole bunch of driving force. This pressure, this uh, column on the, the left in dark blue is uh, a selected driving force of 0.2 bar, 8.5 bar, and so forth. And then I use those polynomials to calculate the resultant flow. But now here's the thing. The polynomial that we fitted, it's just a dumb polynomial. It does not know the physical significance of what you're doing, and it's only applicable across the range where you applied it. If you go a little bit further, it'll start wonking out in all sorts of directions, and it won't be really representative of what's going on in your flow system. So if you look here... I've got a whole bunch of negative values calculated for the lower pressures. And that's because we've got that threshold pressure uh, to, to break on branch B and C. And if you went and allowed yourself to plot uh, negative values on the flow, you'd see it looks something like this. Uh, so this dark blue line is summing all those negative values. And this is meaningless, this minus 100 cubic meters an hour. Again, that's just because you're using a dumb polynomial. So what you need to do is you calculate these values and every place where you have a negative value, delete it, put a zero. What you're trying to say is below a driving force of boom, I have no flow, not negative flow. And so here we see the polynomial as I get it from my equation. And uh, here a simple check in the cell of uh, if it's less than zero, then just give me a zero value. Otherwise, give me the value and never go beyond the pressure, the driving pressure uh, that you fitted the polynomial for. So if in the graph I've got up to 12 bar, don't look at the polynomial for 13 bar. So now I've got positive flow only. And I can sum uh, these three values on the right-hand side here, positive flows only, and get the total flow through the system, through all three parallel branches that diverge on the left-hand side over here. So now that we've summed all of those together, I can plot the total flow through my system, all parallel branches, as a function of some driving force. And we get this weirdly humped-looking uh, a system curve with x and y axis inverted. So now let's not look at the curve too closely. Let's flip it back to the way we're used to looking at system curves, flow versus pressure drop. And there we are. The dark blue line is now the total system curve for three parallel branches that don't meet. If we have a look over here, you can see the dark blue line is not exactly on the light blue line, and it should be. The only reason that's happening is because the spaces I took for my picked driving forces, uh, they, they weren't small enough, and you could do that if you wanted to. But obviously, below a pressure of not, uh, below a driving force of 0.6 bar, I have no flow through branch B and no flow through branch C because 0.6 is the minimum to get into B and 2 bar is the minimum to get into branch C. So below 0.6 bar, the total system curve is the curve for branch A. But then as soon as we increase the driving force up to past 0.6 bar, that's when we get our first shoot across of the system curve. And all of a sudden, for very little pressure drop, we can increase flow dramatically, which is why it becomes so flat, this system curve. And then once again, at, we have another kink at this two bar pressure. All of a sudden, I'm applying two bar pressure and boom, I can get into the header and I can, I don't need to increase this very much more. Uh, and I've increased the flow into branch C quite quickly. So once again, you can use this combined system curve, 
But if you want to know individual branch flows, you just follow a horizontal line. So uh, let's take the very last value of 200 uh, cubic meters per hour. If we have 200 cubic meters uh, of flow per hour, we have a driving force of just above three and a half bar and the respective branch flows, I said the same thing last time, the respective branch flows are just over 50 for branch A, uh, just under 75 for branch B, and then for branch C, we've got this value. I really should know what these are, somewhere above 75. Hope that helps.